I'm Addison Snow with Intersect 360 Research, and I'm really thankful to DDN for hosting me here in their booth again for our market update presentation on high-performance computing, hyperscale, and AI markets. Intersect 360 Research is an industry analyst firm that covers these high-performance markets in this space. We have a lot of market data that comes from both our supply side and our demand side models. You can follow us on all of our social media channels, myself, at Addison Snell on Twitter, we have at Intersect 360, at This Week in HPC is our weekly podcast called This Week in HPC, uh, which I do together with Michael Feldman, who's the editor at Top500.org, and they're our distribution partners. Uh, it's another great source for HPC information. Um, I'm going to really quickly go through a lot of data and hopefully have time to take a little bit of questions at the end, but looking at the total market size is just a touch point to start off. These are all for 2017 base numbers. Of course, 2018, we're still in process right now, so we don't have total market years on 2018 yet, but I'll get to that at the end of the presentation. The total worldwide high-performance computing market, this is all product and services spending. The total market was over $35 billion in 2017. 2017, and that was up slight growth from 2016. Now, that looks like a relatively flat market with, with flat growth. I promise you that what happened was actually a lot more interesting than that. There were a lot of compelling industry dynamics, some of which were up and some of which were down, and they netted out to what looked like a low growth market. Now, this is a long-term stable market, first of all, for the for the basic reason that high, that science is like that, right? We don't get to the end of science and finish it and say, great, we're done, we can go home now. No, if we solve one scientific problem, that just leads us to the next one. And high-performance computing is related to scientific discovery, which then begets engineering advancement and innovation. Uh, and more than half of the high-performance computing market is in those commercial markets. So there's a lot of enduring uh, demand-side pull. Now, whenever we do market size, this is our most boring chart, but it has a point. Whenever we do a market size, we look at it multiple ways. We have both supply side indicators, which is talking to the vendors in this space, reading their quarterly and annual reports. We build a supply side model, and we have demand side research where we survey the end user community and ask them about their budgets and what they're spending money on. We combine those two models. Now, for 10 straight years, those two models did us a favor of always lining up in the middle. So it was easy. We had our market size. This past year was the first time we had a significant gap between those two market models. They were off by about six, seven percentage points. It was too much that we couldn't just wave our hand at it and say, that's OK. Now, it turned out we had all the data we needed. Uh, it looked like the demand side indicators were up, but the supply side indicators were down. And we had to net out what had happened there. Now, the first thing that was in the gap that we peeled away was in the budgets going up, a big part of commercial HPC budgets going up was an increase in facility spending, which was masked at the top level by a lot of times it got moved out of the HPC budget, right, and made someone else pay for it. But nevertheless, more of budgets were consumed by facilities costs, which didn't translate to uh, product and services spending. The second thing that happened was the cloud had a breakout year in HPC, which then isn't reflected in the traditional uh, server and storage networking vendor numbers, and that accounted for part of the gap. Storage was weak relative to server spending, and this is an important dynamic here too. A lot of that is related to AI and people going to more GPU-heavy configurations. We saw a really similar thing happen five, six years ago with respect to big data where big data didn't really become a separate stack of infrastructure for everybody, but rather analytics, and as much as it was a popular workload, got mixed in with existing HPC infrastructures. And people had basically the same configurations they already had, except we saw a sharp uptick in flash adoption. And if I had the same amount of storage capacity, but more of it was flash, that reflected into higher dollars per byte, and we saw a bump in storage relative to everything else. Now what we're seeing is the same thing on the server side. But now it's machine learning and AI is getting mixed into the overall workload. I keep the same number of nodes I might have had, but more of them are GPU enabled. And that has led to a bump in the server spending where the servers consume more of the budget relative to storage. So there's a bit of a rebucketing. 
Um, some vendors did very well in HPC, but poorly in their other enterprise areas. So when you read the annual report or the quarterly report, the best you can do is look at the enterprise business unit. HPC isn't broken out separately. Usually, it tracks together. But last year, that didn't happen. There were some, some key vendors that did very well in HPC, but not as well in their other enterprise areas. And HPC wound up just being a much higher proportion of their business uh, than, than we're used to tracking. This is what all of this looked like pictorially. The servers were up kind of in line with the forecast that we've been seeing for the market, more than 7%, and that's the largest portion of the market. Storage was also up but not by nearly as much, by less than 3%. Then the next three categories, actually software is a larger category than storage, but the next three categories on top of that hardware, the networks, the software, the services, all of those categories declined as the budgets got realigned within them. And then cloud up top is that thin green layer. That had 44% growth overall, but from what's been a very small base. Now, that's by revenue of the market. That doesn't mean that only 3% of HPC users use cloud at all. No. More than a third of HPC users use cloud sometimes, but it typically represents a small portion of their overall workload or spending at an HPC budget level, and it nets out to about... 3.6% of the market now. Now, it did cross $1 billion for the first time to $1.1 billion of the market was cloud. And we're going to see that stay in a high growth phase this year and next year before it eventually starts to moderate down to a more sustainable growth rate. But we are in a high growth phase for cloud now. And if we zoom in on those cloud numbers, this is now taking this, this green sliver and blowing it out into the different cloud categories. What we see is down at the bottom, Raw cycles grew at roughly the same percent as the server proportion did. That grew along with the market, and that's been most of what we had seen in cloud so far. But what really took off were the value-added proportions on top of that, not just the storage, which bumped, but especially um, the infrastructure hosting, which is what we would combine IaaS and PaaS and infrastructure hosting. There's not really enough distinction between those within HPC to merit separating them. And then looking at SaaS, which is essentially application hosting, I'm, I'm running my application in the cloud, that's where my cloud licensing takes place. That had the most growth, it more than doubled by 125%. So things we attribute that to, uh, everyone goes and talks about machine learning, which certainly has a fair degree of cloud affinity. That's not actually what was the main driver here. The big drivers were, first of all, there was a, a significant maturation of licensing models in the ISV space, where it became easier to migrate my ANSYS license, my Dyna license, my Fluent license. I could move those to cloud more easily on a utility or hourly basis. And that was also aided by uh, the the, the uh, cloud managed services space of companies like Rescale or Nimbix or R Systems or Cycle Computing, which is now part of Azure. But that space makes it, again, easier to lift your HPC infrastructure into cloud environments and integrate it as if it's part of your workload. Because the important thing to recognize with this is that most of it is not cloud versus on-prem. It's cloud in addition to on-prem. These are almost entirely hybrid clouds. It's not a, a, an either-or scenario. HPC users are pretty sophisticated about when does it make economic sense to move from on-premise to cloud on a selective basis, and the cloud portion of the market is getting better at doing that in a collaborative way. Um, so overall, the forecast for product and services going forward, this looks like a pretty smooth line, and forecasts are like that. I like to quote my business partner, Chris Willard, who's our chief research officer. He said once about forecasting, the, things about, the thing about forecasts is they have to be in some sense bound by what's realistic, whereas reality has no such limitations. Reality can go do whatever it wants. So we don't forecast things like wars or you know, uh, uh, floods or natural disasters. And that tends to smooth out the forecast from really unusual things that can disrupt the market. When they do happen, like for example, the flooding in Southeast Asia that disrupted the storage market a few years ago, we catch that in the actuals and we saw that it really changed the numbers. Um, but in as much as this looks smooth, you'll notice that these are all independent growth rates. For example, cloud, that green portion near the top, has a much higher growth rate than, than everything else does. Everything is forecasted separately 
separately. All the product and services categories, all the vertical markets, all the geographies are forecast separately. The different um, the, the, the different size classifications of the server space from entry level up through supercomputer all have independent growth rates. This is the aggregate or, or composite forecast. Servers are still the, the dominant portion here followed by software. Software actually has one of the lower growth rates because in as much as the, the, uh, the software is a key portion here, the the increasing prices in the ISV software are being offset by an industry migration to incorporate more open source. So the growth rate winds up being mitigated because more of it moves off of the uh, license space. Storage is one of the higher growth areas. Uh, budget outlooks overall, which are a demand side component of this forecast, have all improved across the board, particularly in the government sector. Government had been flat for many years, not just U.S. government, but worldwide. We had the Eurozone crisis. Asia had its own special problems for a while. But now worldwide government outlooks are improving over the five-year outlook for high-performance computing, and that's another contributor to these forecasts. So there are fundamental drivers here. As I said with HPC, there's always more science to do. That's why this is a long-term stable market. And, and most HPC use, usage is commercial. Drivers for HPC and cloud that will remain strong. It's suitable to variable workloads. I can get early access to high performance components, the maturation of licensing models. And then AI is helping to drive both of these things right now, both HPC on-premise and in the cloud. If we look at the server classes right now, entry level up through supercomputer, um, if you compare this to other analyst methodologies, you'll find there are different breaks here in terms of what constitutes a supercomputer. This is the methodology that makes the most sense for our clients to look at things of uh, one and a half million dollars and up as a supercomputer. But the highest growth is concentrated in the high end of this, and in the forecast, it's the same. If I did a five-year forecast, the higher growth is concentrated toward the high end of the market, and it's lower growth at the lower end right now. Um, revenue by vertical is one of the most important things that we look at in terms of vertical markets. And then in bold around the outside there, you see the, the different sectors, academic, government versus commercial. Academic is about 18% of this market and is just one, uh, just one wedge that we don't further decompose. I understand there are a lot of different applications within academia, but it's hard to break them out within that because they tend to be mixed workload environments. If you tried to separate out biosciences from astrophysics, well, you find they're running on the same machine. So from a revenue perspective, it's an academic, tends to be mixed workload environment. Government has uh, four categories there, down to state or local government is the one that's almost in, uh, invisible. The two main categories are national security versus national research labs. Then there's another category you have called national agency, which is similar to a national research lab, but it's when you have a single focus lab, which could be a, a, could be something like weather, like ECMWF or NOAA, or it could be the National Cancer Institute, but it's something that's not a general purpose lab, but rather focused in one particular agency. Um, one thing I do like to point out here, we don't have weather as a vertical market um, because Weather isn't a vertical market, it's an application type, so we don't really see it be as a vertical because, sure, we can have weather agencies we could count, we could estimate out how many of those national agencies are weather, but what about when weather gets done by uh, University of Colorado Boulder, or NASA Ames Research Labs, or JAXA, or Fleet Numerical? right, uh, which is part of the Navy. You get weather in academia, in national security, in national research labs, and in some of the different commercial spaces as well. So if you pull out one vertical and say, well, here are the weather agencies, you count less than half of it. And if you want to count all of it, but you don't want to double count, it kind of gets funny. So for our clients who want weather, we can pull it out, but it's composite from the other things. Commercial um, is more than half the, the uh, usage by revenue of all HPC, as I said before. Finance is either the largest or the second largest vertical market, depending on whether you want to combine the two manufacturing segments, which here are shown separately between large product manufacturing, which is essentially automotive and aerospace, but also includes things like tractors or other things that are big like that. 
um, versus consumer product manufacturing, which is where you get all of the consumer products and Procter and Gamble and stuff like that. Um, they're very similar types of workloads, and some of our clients like looking at them together as one big manufacturing segment. Some of our clients like thinking them different from a sales engagement standpoint. Here we're showing them separately. If it's one manufacturing segment, then that's the largest. If it's two separate manufacturing segments, then finance is the largest. Everyone with me? That's a matter of taste more than anything else. It's just how you like to look at the market. Biosciences, which is the, the deep crimson or, or red one there, is actually the most diverse vertical market in this space, both in terms of what type of end user it is and also what type of application it is. Could be a pharmaceutical company, could be an agricultural company, it could be a genomics lab, right? And we see applications across biochemistry, biostatistics, molecular modeling, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics. Uh, as I said, the, the agricultural space is actually one of the higher growing areas right now. Agricultural engineering is what we call it in the HPC space when you want to stay out of the political uh, mention of the term GMO, right? If you want, I mean, GMO is what it is, what they're doing, but that's a politically charged term. So it's, it's agricultural engineering in the HPC side. Um, energy, of course, is the oil and gas space. It's mostly seismic processing with some reservoir simulation. There are two that I'll highlight here very quickly. Financial services I already talked about, and there are a lot of different use cases there. Um, risk management is the largest and fastest growing one. Uh, trading, of course, the, the high frequency trading or, or algorithmic trading is another that's very uh, commonly discussed. Analytics is a broad category within finance, but the hot one right now is the fourth one, which is pricing. Um, there's always been some HPC used for the pricing of things like derivatives that get complicated in, in, in response to changing market conditions. I highlighted it here because this is the area that is furthest down the path within HPC of on-the-ground deployment of AI and machine learning, deep learning. You know, we can talk about self-driving cars and personalized medicine. You're going to have personalized interest rates first, right? There's more money there. If they can individualize the data to get individualized pricing and interest rates on things in response to changing market conditions, there's a lot of AI going on there right now. Chemical, I also highlighted that's abbreviated there. I don't mean chemistry like biochemistry and chemical engineering, which is over in biosciences. I mean chemical engineering like plastics and polymers. Companies like Dow, DuPont, 3N, BASF. Um, this has been our, on our watch list for a long time in this space because they've been HPC users, but mostly on the process side. Like I do a CFD simulation of my mix tank to get a good yield on my plastics. And we've been waiting for that to migrate over like it did in biosciences to start moving that into the scientific analysis of the chemicals that they're doing and eventually get toward things like molecular modeling in the plastics and polymer space. That now is starting to happen on the scientific discovery end of things. And BASF last year put in their first petaflop supercomputer, the Curiosity machine. We think that's the tip of the spear of what's going to be a higher growth area for that segment. Server shares, I'll do quickly in this space. Obviously, we have exact numbers on all of these things. HPE and Dell are the ones at the top of the market. Um, and, uh, and then it drops off to the next tier below that. Um, servers grew well in this space. The only companies that we really saw as down last year were Cray, which doesn't concern me because Cray's business is so cyclical and tied to individual deals that they can have an individual down year and it doesn't really bother me. They tend to bounce back from that. IBM concerned me a lot more because it had to do with a, a strategic focus on areas in AI and cognitive beyond HPC. I think we're going to see them correct on that and come back a little more toward the HPC space. They ought to be able to improve on that with their power systems. Uh, coming back into this space going forward. There's a lot in that others category. There are a lot of resellers in this space, smaller suppliers. So, you know, if they're not counted here, there's still a great percentage in that others wing for the long tail of this market. Um, if we partly get informed by end user data on this. So this is now survey data, not revenue or market model data. It's very important everyone understand we're now looking at raw survey data of what people tell us they have installed. Again, HPE comes in number one, followed by Dell EMC. And again, we see Lenovo. Supermicro has been coming up more and more in this space, although I think they'll see a hiccup right now. 
due to the whole Bloomberg business thing that went live and just caused a lot of uncertainty. And we could have an entire separate discussion around that. And I don't want to derail on it, but Supermicro has been an important uh, uh, important vendor in this space. AWS is the top named cloud vendor, and we do see them as the top market share for cloud in HPC. Storage shares. Um, important when we talk about storage in HPC that we separate out high performance storage, like storage that's designed for HPC, which will be things like DDN or Panassas, versus storage that gets used in HPC for HPC applications, whether it was designed for HPC or not. The same thing happens with HPC clusters. It could be the same system in enterprise or in HPC, and this happens a great deal. Uh, in this space, Dell EMC just has so many different product lines and so much footprint, they wind up being number one in storage. And if you combine servers and storage, Dell overtakes HPE into the number one position narrowly for servers and storage combined. NetApp is number two, and their partnership with Lenovo that was announced this year was very important. HPE is then third, so the, the top three line up in different ways. Now, the big thing that happened here, as I said, storage was flat, so you see others that are down here, but that could be down just slightly or, or close to flat. That doesn't, again, doesn't concern me much because, again, as the market picks up, they'll all go forward. The trend that did happen here that went against companies like DDN and Panassas is that more of the storage last year went toward companies that also sell servers. So it was consolidating into servers space last uh, uh, last year. Now, if we look at the survey side, and this really gets to what people associate as high-performance storage, that's where a company like DDN leaps to the top because they think of DDN as their high-performance storage and don't associate as much with an EMC or or uh, or, or, uh, or something outside of that as, as, as HPC storage, and DDN does very well in this. I meant to say at the top of, the, of my presentation, this is not a sponsored presentation. I'm very grateful to DDN for hosting the presentation, but, but, it's, but it's our standard presentation that we're giving here, and this is where DDN shows up in that survey. Um, we have a ton of data on system interconnects. This gets really small, but a big thing that we were looking at here is is the uptake of Omnipath into this space over the last couple of years. Interesting, we did see it get a toehold into the market upon introduction last year. The fascinating thing that happened is it didn't really come out of uh, InfiniBand's share. Now, this is, again, survey data, not, not market revenue data, but mostly it came out of the high-end Ethernet space. And now this year we're seeing a resurgence in high-end Ethernet. So I'm concerned about the toehold for Omnipath and how far that goes in the market. We're going to have to continue to track it going forward. As far as the suppliers goes, Mellanox has really been on top of that, not only as a system interconnect, but also as a storage interconnect, and even as a LAN. Within HPC environments, you know, lands, you think, okay, everyone's just going to buy Cisco. Well, okay, a third or more of the market bought Cisco, but Mellanox is the number two provider of LAN interconnects within HPC environments just because they get into the high performance space there. Um, top generally available applications in this space. This is again tracked out of our site census survey. We have thousands of mentions in our database of. of people tell us what they're running, and then we aggregate that to the top. The top 10 uh, combined wind up being only about a third overall of all the mentions that we get in this space, and this is named applications. So we've already taken out from this chart all of the in-house applications, which are by definition an end value of one, right? I. I, I made the application. I'm the only one that uses it. It's a big part of my workload. It's important to me. That's a large part of the HPC market, but it's not shown in this chart because all it would do is distort everything. Uh, so this is when people are running named applications. The top ones get 5% of the market, Gromax, Fluent, Gaussian. Uh, but then you can see coming down. Now, OpenFoam has been one of the fast growers in this space. I mentioned the transition from licensed uh, applications to open source, and that's been a big part of that there. Hyperscale market. So this is a quick transition for HPC. We separately tra uh, track the hyperscale market in HPC. Everyone gets the, the difference between HPC and hyperscale, right? We, we started tracking hyperscale uh, when we started 11 years ago because we knew that companies like Google and Yahoo at the time were incorporating HPC 
uh, into their workloads to achieve their extreme scale. But by 2014, four years ago, we knew in our methodology that what was now called hyperscale had grown and evolved to where it wasn't really part of the HPC market. It was a separate force. And we started breaking that out into a separate, uh, separate market. That grew 25% year over year to $44 billion in 2017. Uh, that was $35 billion in 2016. It's consolidating further into the Tier 1. Our Tier 1 here is organizations that spend over $1 billion per year on, on information technology. That's $1 billion with a book on billion. It's, I have to stress this because there's an order of magnitude difference between hyperscale and HPC. A large-scale supercomputer like a really big one, costs on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. There are nine organizations in the hyperscale side that spend over one billion per year. So that's the equivalent of 10 of those supercomputers per year going in. The largest one nearly, met, uh, just the, the largest one hit nine billion last year. And probably this year we'll spend $10 billion on IT this year. The top nine here, these nine organizations spend almost as much in those nine companies as the entire worldwide HPC market top to bottom. Not quite, 10% less. But that's the order of magnitude we're talking about here. So when you see companies like Intel and Nvidia really starting to design hyperscale first, that's why. Because you can get one company and it can be a market maker, right, that, that sets you up. We also track Tier 2 and Tier 3 down through this. There are other hyperscale companies that don't spend a billion a year. You get into LinkedIn and Wikipedia and Netflix, right? Those guys aren't Tier 1, but they're important, uh, uh, important component of the, uh, of the hyperscale market. This is now through its major expansion and started to consolidate. And like I said, more of the revenue went into that Tier 1 space. AI, deep learning, machine learning, spans both HPC and hyperscale. Now, when someone asks about the AI market, this is a tricky proposition, okay? Because when you ask an analyst about a market size, we're, pay, we're, we, we're paid to be pedantic and get persnickety about definitions. And, and Chris Willard and I believe that if you're going to size a market, you ought to be able to draw a circle around it and define what it is you're counting. Notice that this never happened with big data. I didn't like it if some analyst would say big data is a $30 billion market unless they could tell me how many big data is that and how much does each one cost, right? There was never a good methodology that separated big data from anything else. It was part of enterprise spending. If there was a new $30 billion, where did it come from? The enterprise computing stayed flat over that time. It was just a redefinition of things you were already counting. Now with AI, so the first question is, can you identify any infrastructure where you can draw a circle around it and say, this infrastructure is dedicated to AI? The answer is, yes, you can. And that's about $4.5 billion in 2017 with a very high growth rate that's nearly doubling year over year in the near term. But more than 90% of that comes from hyperscale. You get Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Baidu, investing very heavily in AI. They have dedicated AI infrastructures. That accounts for most of it. Within HPC, we've done research on this and have a report, Machine Learning's Impact on HPC Environments. What we find is it's mostly mixed workload environments in budgets that you already had, like with big data. Maybe I got a little bit of a budget bump. But generally within HPC, we don't see AI mixed out into separate infrastructure. A little bit in finance. We do see it in finance, which I mentioned earlier. But outside of that, it tends to be a mixed workload. And then you can get into the consumer areas. But you know, you could buy a set of smart speakers. OK, does it have AI in it? Sure. But that's part of the speaker's market. You already counted it as part of the speaker's market. A self-driving car is part of the market for cars. If you don't want to double count things, you have to be careful about your methodology and what you count. So dedicated AI, deep learning, machine learning spending, $4.5 billion, but mostly in hyperscale. The parts that are in HPC are mostly mixed workload, and we have a very detailed report about what that looks like. When is it same infrastructure, different infrastructure? Changing my configuration, same configuration. Same people, different people. Same budget, different budget. We have all of that detailed in a, uh, in a separate report. 
Um, now, overall, more than half of HPC sites are already doing machine learning in one form or another, and most of the rest are working to implement it. So no doubt this is having a huge influence within HPC sites, and we're going to continue to track that. One of my favorite things within this, by the way, is that I, what we're going to see is not AI versus HPC, but where are we going to see AI augmented HPC? in this space? What is the merger of where can you see AI guiding HPC? Uh, one quick example of that I'll give that's my favorite is for years in this space, like two decades, we've talked about person in the loop simulations, engineer in the loop. The idea that you could do a multi-physics model and have, as the engineer makes changes to the models, you resolve all of your multi-physics equations, your fluids, your structures, your noise vibration and harshness, and you re-optimize that on the fly. It never really took off, even when multi-physics became a thing, because the human-to-computer latency was too high to make that really viable. But what about AI in the loop, right? If we can teach AI to play Go, we ought to be able to teach AI to play perturb the model of the airplane wing and figure out what is a new optimal solution. You can guide it, you can give it the rules of the game and then let it go and see if it comes up with solutions that your engineer can then go back and check. So you didn't, you didn't alleviate the need to do any of the CFD or the CAE, you still do it, but you have an AI guiding discovery and you basically use it for target elimination, which is where HPC has also been used successfully in other areas. One other one I'll mention quickly that's not specific to any particular application, but as we see increase in tiered storage, right, a big part of high performance storage isn't just having a high bandwidth file system to one tier, but how do you integrate those different tiers in areas like burst buffers or all the way out to NV DIMMs or in the other direction to nearline archive, cold archives, cloud storage? That's going to mean you need a, a storage vendor who has a view forward toward things like object storage which makes it easier to migrate things between the tiers. High performance storage within 10 years, I think in the commercial HPC space, is going to be less about how do you manage one particular tier, but how do you move data between the tiers. And the reason I'm talking about on this slide is, well, what about an AI-enabled object storage operating system that monitors usage patterns and tries to promote storage to a hotter tier before you ask for it? And if you think that's crazy, hyperscale companies already do this, right? Because if you go into, if I go onto someone's Facebook page because I want to scale back in time looking for pictures from a Halloween party I was at five years ago, and I start scrolling back, then you get the little spinning wheel to get it, get it, as it goes to go look that up. I'm not going to wait seven seconds for you to come get a, a picture of a Halloween party from five years ago. I, I hate that. No one's going to wait seven seconds. Never mind it has to go to space and back to my phone, right? So hyperscale, or if I'm going to watch a movie, right? They want to watch what I might select and pre-buffer the movies I'm likeliest to select before I hit one because I don't want to wait seven seconds for my movie to start. I hate that. Consumers are fickle and they don't want to wait. Bring that mentality into the HPC side. I don't want to wait for my data when I hit return. That same methodology can be brought into using AI to promote data before you ask for it. I think that's going to be a major development in this space. So look ahead to 2019. Early indicators are suggesting strong growth here. We've started taking a look at some of the supply side and demand side data. I think this is going to be a good growth year for the industry, maybe even above what we forecast. We've talked a lot about the processor wars, and I, I really didn't have time to get into it all the data here, but there's been tons of momentum around ARM, including right now at the show, we've got the first petascale ARM system with Astra at Sandia National Labs, is 1.5 petaflops. I'm concerned because there are three different major national or regional exascale level initiatives based on ARM. We just have our first petascale one now. You've got to go from petascale to exascale is a thousand fold increase in what, three to four years? What concerns me is the software in that space. So, you know, I'm, I'm really tracking that. AMD is coming back to this market very strong and we're going to watch that, uh, that move into the, into the market. Storage tiers are proliferating. I talked about that. Battle to possess data. That is the war that's being fought in the hyperscale space. Everyone wants to possess, even if they don't own it, they want to possess your data because that enables them to do AI and, and machine learning on top of it. 
And I think we're going to continue to see uh, consolidation and acquisition in this space, possibly in cloud managed services. Will AWS take on something like a cycle to complement what Microsoft did with Azure? I think middleware expertise is a big thing in this space. Might see areas that are continuing to consolidate. So that is a very rapid fire look across all of our research. I'm Addison Sell with Intersect 360 Research. Thank you very much. Have a great show.